Hey, Brandon. Sam says I can't buy Solana yet on SoFi. I don't know if you should or if you really want to based on what happened to Solana uh, this past week. I think we talked about Solana last uh, in our last session. Where in the, I, I mentioned that the, the concern which I have with Solana was that it is not really decentralized. A lot of tokens, close to 50% were given for insiders. Number two, if you look at the specs of the validator nodes, it's damn so expensive, it's so big um, that not everyone can create a node on Solana and run it, right? So that means there are not too many, uh, the, the number of nodes on Solana probably not really big and uh, hence it could be open and it could be uh, vulnerable to attacks. Uh, that's what we saw on Solana this week. So we had a blockchain issues in Solana. I don't know how closely you're keeping a tie on this, but uh, Solana blockchain was offline for almost what, 20 hours? Close to 20 hours. Um, <clears throat> there were issues uh, since we're talking about it. Uh, so there were uh, issues. They were suddenly seeing a lot of transactions. Uh, Solana's claim to fame is that uh, they are the fastest blockchain uh, that currently exists. 60,000 transactions per second. Uh, but I think whether it was bots, whether it was a denial, distributed denial of service, we don't know what the real reason was. But net net, they actually saw 400,000 transactions being sent over to Solana validators. So that caused the chain to fork because not all validators were uh, on the same. And uh, when those nodes started fork, a lot of these nodes went out of memory and they just shut down means the blockchain is not moving ahead. So that's what happened on Solana. Oh, let me just share my screen. Uh, uh, right. So that's what happened with Solana last week. The chain was not available. This went down. So, uh, yep, and the Solana came back and said, resource exhaustion in the network is causing a denial of service. We are working towards a resolution and we will do a restart. Now, can you uh, actually imagine that if it's a truly decentralized, how could you get everyone on board so quickly to make the changes and, and do a restart, right? You could do it if you have a handful of validators that you need to work with. Right, but if it is truly a decentralized network, then uh, we're having everyone to restart at a short notice just doesn't seem feasible. But it took almost a day to resolve, and we are, and this happened because it is not exactly decentralized. If uh, if you really don't care about the decentralization, which is okay, because not all use cases need huge level of decentralization, right? It depends on what your use case is. And if for that use case, you are still bullish on what Solana is doing and want to participate, go for it. <laughs> I mean, your choice. So I have a concern on uh, at the governance level. Uh, so I, we have been staying out, watching it grow. And... Uh, you know, rooting for my friends from the sidelines. But this was a big news in, in Solana for last week. The blockchain came to grinding halt. Whereas uh, Bitcoin, it's a focus on the Bitcoin side is first thing, the basic principle is we want to be decentralized. That's the reason it is a little slow. Because they don't want to compromise the decentralization uh, and speed, right? We, remember we talked about this trilemma in blockchain, speed, decentralization and security. Security is stable stake. So you can tweak the other two levers whether speed and a decentralization. Um, 
as of now blockchain uh, bitcoin has given more pre- uh, weightage to be staying decentralized if that means it's a little slower at a blockchain level it's okay they're building more solutions on top of bitcoin you know you got a layer 2 solutions you got a side chain uh, solutions um bitcoin inherently at a at its own level one is slower but uh, that's the choice they made solana went for a higher transaction speed or sacrificed some of the decentralizations uh, that's that's the choice they made the question is if you are a developer or if you are a um market participant you have to make your own choice depending on what interest you what's your focus area right? there is a room for every use case there is a room for solana as well the question is is that your use case as well so if you were not able to buy a samul uh, on sofi maybe that is okay uh, but yeah i mean if it's, if not sofi then maybe you switch your broker that's all i can say because we don't know when everyone you know all exchanges have their different policies of what tokens they want to bring uh, to make it available for their customers and uh, based on that maybe sofi doesn't have that uh, solana yet all right so i think by the time we got few more folks joined uh thank you everyone for joining in today um this is more of a informal session uh we started a few months earlier uh, this is an offshoot of another group which is uh, options for retail investors where we generally talk about a lot of investment related stuff um uh, stock crypto and then we realize crypto is getting big uh space or and needed a separate hour on its own so we moved over and started doing the thursday meeting where we focus more on crypto um uh, for those who are joining here for the first time uh, i've been involved in this space mostly from uh, studying the projects and uh, buying crypto just like i would invest in any stock for a few years now um for living that's what i do i invest in stocks invest in crypto economy for paying the bills in the house and putting food on the table i work in uh, a data governance uh, software uh, industry and uh, i love talking um, about investments talking to you guys on saturday and and on thursday uh, we are recording this session and this will be available on um, on youtube i will probably send a link after the once it's pushed out i'll send a link through the meetup the way this is organized is feel free to you know pose questions pitch in with your uh, pet um favorite project we can go and try to look at the project do a little deep dive on that particular project uh, last week someone brought up iotx so we spent 10 15 minutes in trying to understand what iotx project is and uh, educate ourselves on that particular project i want to have a little more of a, a a discussion rather than a monologue but if there are no points to discuss i do bring up some of the content that i have noticed some things that caught my attention in the in the crypto world and bring that up for as a starting point for discussions right but feel free to stop anytime ask questions um as a deem fit or you know participate and and maybe if you have a topic that you want to talk about right if you are on a blockchain developer if you are a developer in this economy maybe share your thoughts on what you see in this world okay. all right so yeah so i wanted to a uh, couple of news you know charts and the tweets of course we talked about solana uh ross's litecoin pump and dump yes that is in my list so we will talk about it and i don't know whether i should blame uh, litecoin for this or i should blame the lame media about it uh, i have a both the feelings so let's jump on to that litecoin because that's been brought up so those are uh, under media bloopers right we had a litecoin issue there was a news 
uh, wire to global news wire. Yeah, Glo Globe News Wire saying that Walmart, news coming from Walmart, saying Walmart will start accepting Litecoin um, on its website as a payment, right? And immediately the Litecoin jumped from 175 to 233. And uh, Walmart said, no, this was a fake news. It never came from the official Walmart. And then Litecoin tanked in you know 45 minutes so this definitely looks uh, was a pump and dump because whoever had sent this they sent it to the domain called walmartcorp.com and this domain was bought in a month ago so this was a pump and dump scheme in the plan in works for maybe a month this was the only press release that was sent through this uh, email ID. And uh, now we can't find the press release anymore because uh, the media, they have already deleted it. Um, so, but that's what happened. Media failed to check, to, to run some basic checks on the content of the, of the press release. Those who are really, those who understand this space, would have immediately figured it out that it was a fake. There were, you know, giveaways in that. For example, it was said that Charlie um, was a, it's a Charles Lee, right? Uh, I forgot there was a Litecoin Foundation. Um, so it, it was mentioned that Charlie Lee, he's a CEO of Litecoin Foundation. Litecoin Foundation does not have any CEO. Charlie Lee was a founder of uh, Litecoin project. He's not a CEO of Litecoin Foundation. And uh, the press release actually talked more about how Litecoin is great rather than talking a lot more about the benefits that Walmart customers would uh, accrue through this. And then there were some basic uh, giveaways in terms of the use of English language, right? English is not my first language. So I have, I'm no one to comment on how someone else would write it. I probably would write the same way, but I'm sure the PR people, the media people, they know what's the perfect English is. So they should have checked up, right? but no one did it. And it was all sent out in public. And then they had to issue a disregard notice, but this happens. You know, and uh, then suddenly the, the detractors of uh, crypto economy say, oh, we should regulate this crypto industry because many investors could have gotten hurt. This is a pump and dump. Someone pumped it up to 233, could have sold it. Individual investors who were suddenly saw light, um, Litecoin going high might have tried to buy it, saying, okay, if there we see a momentum, right? Most of these things are running are run on momentum. And not really on any fundamental basis. So they can do uh, have got in and now regulators might be saying, hey, we should regulate this. I'm like, damn, you should regulate media industry for being irresponsible and not doing any basic checks, not doing very basic due diligence. But uh, yeah, so this was, and this was not the only, um, there is, I would say, irresponsible behavior from media. Sorry, someone was trying to say something. Oh, no, I, I was just saying that they hype it up when it's cryptocurrency, but in reality, they can do the same thing, pump and dump in the stock market too. It's it just it's vulnerable in, in many ways. Yeah, happens every time in the, in the stock market also. You know, but they can kind of say, oh, stock market is regulated. We will figure it out who has done it and all that. Oh, crypto is not regulated. Difficult to find out who has done. But uh, there's a great, uh, uh, this week we had another stuff, right? When we talk about all the bad things that happened, uh, it was a testament to the fact that open economy, open blockchains, et cetera, a free, free market economy, the transparency that the blockchain provide us, is way better than the, the opaqueness which let's say the current stock exchanges have. If someone 
is trying to do an insider trading in stock exchange. It's only SEC that they will be able to figure it out. Right? None of us have any access to the trades. We, we, there is no transparency from exchanges on who is buying what, et cetera. Because we're talking about all these uh, not legal behaviors. So let's also go towards this, this insider trading. So this tweet got a lot of attention. OpenSea uh, is a platform for buying NFTs. The, I would say this is the most famous one. Uh, they have recently did a business of close to more than a billion dollars. And uh, NFTs have been crazy, you know, last few weeks. It's through the roof. So the head of products of OpenSea, and now being a head of product, he had insider information on what NFTs will be available or updated on their first page on their home page right? now what the head of product was doing was to go and buy those nfts before they're promoted on OpenSea's page and then just sell it after they have been promoted because obviously they would see a jump in the pricing um and we didn't need any sec uh forensic sleuths we didn't need any accounting or uh, um you know, a team of lawyers or accountants to figure out this was happening. It's an open blockchain. Zoo TV just tweeted saying, hey, OpenSea, why does it appear that Nate Chastian is ahead of products? Has a few secret wallets that appear to buy your front page drops before they are listed and then sell them shortly after the front page hype, spike for profits, and then tumbles them back into his main wallet with his punk on it. Now we're talking about a public policing kind of a stuff. And this was retweeted and liked so many times that OpenSea had to come up with an official statement saying that they have uncovered evidence of insider trading. I've never seen this kind of uh, community driven policing in the stock market. We have no idea. We won't even know who borrows, so it's only SEC or the law enforcement who will have to ask the exchanges because all the data is opaque. And today, there was a news that Nate Chastian, he has resigned from OpenSea. So of course, he was, a, he was a, you know, this was not legal and uh, got caught. The community caught him. It wasn't the police. It wasn't law enforcement. It wasn't SEC. Hell, I mean, we don't even have laws against or for whether it's insider trading is illegal or not. This is not a regulated market space. So I don't even know if this is actually illegal in terms in eyes of law. But the fact that community brought this up and uh, you know, he had to resign and the open had, the exchange had to admit this. This really goes back to restore the faith. Of course, if they wouldn't have taken this action, this completely, completely would undermine the confidence in the free and open economy and decentralization, right? Uh, this was, I would say, a little negative, but a positive thing to see how um, an unacceptable behavior got noticed by the community and uh, it got what done in a day it was found out yesterday oh, sorry on 14th 15th 14th uh, 15th morning OpenSea came up with a statement and today 16th Nate is out I've never seen this <laughs> quick reaction uh, before, but that's what it is, democratizing. So 
Yeah, the other one, the media blooper that I wanted to refer was uh, New York Times. Again, they published, and I don't have access to the to the content, but I saw it in one of the tweet. I saw the screenshot. I cannot, uh, couldn't recall which account was that where I saw that uh, screenshot. I think the 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 context behind this was that Bitcoin is not as uh, secure as the maxis or the proponents of Bitcoin make it out to be. FBA actually were able to hack the, the wallets of the colonial pipe hackers. Completely irresponsible um, media behavior here. They should have at least done, should have gone a step further and to the truth, try to figure out what exactly FBI did. FBI never, they didn't break the encryption of the wallet. They were handed over the keys by the exchange. So there are two theories. I don't know, do you want me to go back? I mean, we talked about it when this actually happened and when FBI was able to recover more than 50% of the ransom uh, that was paid to colonial pipe uh, hackers. So if there's an interest, I can talk about it. What were the couple of reasons that how how this was worked out? And it, this is really not that FBA was able to break into the wallet. FBA was able to break the encryption key. Now that they didn't break the uh, blockchain security. So, so there are two th theories behind it. Number one is the hackers were a little lazy or maybe you could call it a stupid that they, the wallet that they had was hosted on exchange. They did not move it out from the exchange to a self custody wallet soon enough. Now, Bitcoin being a public blockchain, we know where those funds were sent. And we, then we know where that, that wallet was belonging to an exchange. That exchange is uh, within the US jurisdiction. So they got, FBI had all the judicial powers to go and sub another exchange and force the exchange to hand over the private key of the wallet to FBI. So it's like, they didn't break the lock. They just got the key and they just opened the lock. So that is one theory. The other theory that was that FBI in the Australian uh, law enforcement agency, they had created an, an app and released it in, uh, in, dark, uh, in the dark side of the internet, which is mostly frequented by uh, lawbreakers, hackers, drug dealers. They released in that internet and a lot of um, uh, these um, hackers and and um, those who want to escape law, they were using this app that they had no clue that this app was actually developed by law enforcement. But the US unique selling proposition, USP of that messaging app was its encryption, right? And then Australian and FBI police have been monitoring all the mess messages and chatter going on through that app. The second theory is maybe these hackers were actually using those apps and someone might have posted the information about the private key. So these are the two theories, but there's no way FBI actually broke the encryption or, or broke the wallet over there. Okay. That was the case. Uh, Ross is now we can get only fans to quit the conventional payment system and get them to adopt crypto. Yeah, they had some tough time in dealing with their banking uh, partners and all that. But I think they're back up. Yeah, if they move to crypto, probably they won't have they won't have to bend to uh, to the wishes of their uh, payment processors. But I guess it's, it's a long time before we see everyone start to adopt one or the other form of payments. What else we saw uh, this week? Mm, 
We talked about this. Well, this came in today. Now we are talking, now we are not even talking about uh, crypto companies. We are talking about a fintech company which does deal in crypto. I mean, if you're a now a new fintech and you don't deal in crypto, it's like you're from a dinosaur age. So Revolut is a fintech company, provide banking services, provide, um, I think also the investing services, but based out of UK. Um, so Revolut bought uh, office working space from WeWork and they paid in Bitcoin. So now we are actually seeing uh, a real world transaction happening between two real world companies to uh, actually being transact or doing the transaction in Bitcoin, which is good news, adoption. Right, so uh, other one again, Fidelity the retirement powerhouse is now imploring SEC to approve Bitcoin ETF. Of all the ETF uh, issuers whose applications are pending at SEC, this took me by surprise that it will be Fidelity who will push SEC to move fast on this and lobby SEC to approve Bitcoin ETF. But, uh, I have my own doubts. I don't know whether this will happen this year or not. Um, current SEC has defied all the uh, optimism that the community had during the start of a year when Gary Gensner was uh, confirmed as SEC chairman. Um, they've defied all the positive sentiments that we had. Uh, SEC has been really tough on crypto economy or crypto companies uh, as such. We saw what happened with Coinbase. Coinbase is being sued even before they, they don't even have a product that they've launched and as it's saying, if you launch it, we'll sue you. And there are no guidelines on why it, that product is considered a security. Whereas these products already exist in this world, basically crypto lending products are useful. In Coinbase says we want to launch a lending product. SEC says, nope, you have to register this as a security. You're not registered with the SEC. So if you launch this, we'll sue you. And now we are seeing what's happening in the media, the dirty clothes being washed. They are lashing out over each other, um, talking about you know, how the regulators are, kind of a stifling innovation in the blockchain uh, economy in US. First of all, we don't have a clarity on, there are no rules around which specify more clearly why this thing is considered as a security. Oh, but they're saying you're violating the law. We don't know what the law is. So, so I guess it'll be still some time before we see Bitcoin ETF. There are a few, which are coming near the deadline. I think in the mid of October, end of October, then I think there are a couple in, uh, in November. If my memory serves me right, there are almost 12 to 13 ETFs, application, ETF applications that are waiting with SEC for approval. And uh, SEC have uh, 240 days and they can keep, they have been kicking the can down multiple, they have kicked it down for multiple times on one of the few uh, applications uh, and not really giving any yay or nay signal. But let's see what happens now. Uh, Fidelity in their recent meetings with the SEC officials, looks like they persuaded them to, to allow um, Bitcoin ETF. I don't know what the reason could be. So let's see, what, what do they say? They met with SEC staff on September 8, gave a presentation laying out the reasons for SEC to approve a Bitcoin ETF now. It says investor benefits of exchange regulated ETP providing direct exposure to Bitcoin. 
a Bitcoin market maturity, product innovation, fidelity, okay, and fidelity investment advisor region, Bitcoin trust. Oh, so this is an ET, uh, ETP exchange traded product. Not really ETFs, though th there are some uh, subtle differences between how ETP and ETF operate. In ETP, you're dependent on exchange traded product, you're dependent upon the issuer. But if it is coming for fidelity, I don't, I won't have too much concerns on the issuers. Right? If it was coming from an not such, not such a well-known brand, then I would have a concern on ETP coming from that particular issuer. But for fidelity, uh, I'll, for all practical purpose, I will consider it to be equivalent of an uh, ETF. Okay. And the say other countries have already approved it. We got Canada, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany. How did they miss Brazil? Brazil has also approved uh, a Bitcoin ETF. Yeah. So we believe Bitcoin future-based products are not a necessary interim step, which is what SEC has already told that they are okay. They are more willing to approve Bitcoin future-based ETF, but not Bitcoin-based ETF. And then we have seen after SEC gave this kind of a hint, we saw a couple of issuers um, you know, sending applications for Bitcoin future-based ETF, which might get approved. Uh, but I'm waiting for the real, the, the spot Bitcoin-based uh, ETF or the ETF in which if you have to, when someone buys that ETF, you actually have to buy a real Bitcoin and not based on the derivative, which is Bitcoin future. But we'll see. Big players are in this. Uh, it's not just Walker, it's not just uh, uh, my, uh, Galaxy Digital. Now we, we got a fidelities of the world in this. So hopefully things will move. But I am not jumping with joy. <laughs> this has been a very, uh, I would say, painfully uh, slow wait to understand what SEC is going to do. Because we talked of futures. And Coinbase understands that maybe Bitcoin ETF may not be coming soon. But uh, looks like Coinbase also wants to offer crypto futures and uh, crypto derivatives. So we did notice that Coinbase actually had registered. They filed an application with NFA. I think that's National Future Association uh, or whatever it is. I don't recall really, to register as an FCM, which is Futures Commission Merchant. Why would Coinbase do it? Because they are seeing that a lot of transactions, so the, um, the dollar amount of Bitcoin futures that get traded is more than the dollar amount of the, for the spot Bitcoin that gets traded on Coinbase. So they want to dip their feet in futures product, in derivatives product. But you can't do it unless you are registered as a future commission merchant. So they, Coinbase filed an application of Coinbase says, Coinbase filed an application with NFA to register, blah, blah, blah. This is the next step to broaden our offerings. Goal, further grow the crypto economy. Now let's like answer why Coinbase is doing it. It's a multi-billion dollar game. 4.8 billion worth of Bitcoin futures traded in past one day. 4.8, just Bitcoin and tens of billions if you include the altcoins as well. Right. As only a spot exchange, Coinbase made 1.8 billion in Q1 this year. But the demand for futures market for a lucrative market and Coinbase wants a piece of that. It's all about money. If they can't, uh, so Coinbase has ambitions to start their lending product, right? Apart from just exchange, do lending and borrowing. But right now, SEC has tied their hands on around the lending borrowing product. That's okay. So now they're trying to uh, looking to move into uh, crypto futures market by getting this license. We'll see what happens. 
anyone of you been following Coinbase, uh, interested in Coinbase? Because it's a public company. Or own Coinbase, or have any thoughts around Coinbase, or maybe work in Coinbase. Any thoughts to share? Ah, looks like none. So what else caught my eye? Uh, Bitcoin taproot. So the, I think the confirmation was done uh, somewhere in May or June, July, I forgot about that. But the, the next biggest uproot, uh, up, not uproot, upgrade in four years will be happening in a, around November. Right. Manny says, I avoid Coinbase. Uh, avoid in terms of what? Not buying Coinbase shares or not using Coinbase as an exchange for uh, crypto money. It is a little expensive. I, I will give that. Uh, not using uh, centralized exchanges. Yeah, it, it is centralized. Question, Sam. Yeah, Sam, what's your question? Um, I met a guy on Tuesday. I was volunteering. Well, not really volunteering. I was paid, but I was a poll worker for the new some recall. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy, uh, the security guard, said he stuck a hundred dollars on Coinbase in Bitcoin a few years ago. He he has all the correct information, but Coinbase won't let him access his account any longer. I just told him to uh, call the supervisor. I mean, Coinbase is responsible, correct? Yeah. So if if he if he had, so when you say, so I don't know in terms of what did he has when you say that I have all the correct information. I mean, you do have your, your username, password. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you pathetic. the customer service is pathetic in in this one, and it is very difficult. Uh, and I'll tell you, I had my own. Uh, I had uh, moved uh, from my bank account. I moved USD to uh, Coinbase, and it didn't show up. It showed up a little late. I think now it, it was before there. You know, it was instant. Now it's an instant deposit. And I sent an email to Coinbase saying, hey, what happened to my deposit? And uh, it came a few days later, so it's okay. And I went on with my business on Coinbase. But after three months, I got an email from a Coinbase uh, saying, hey, thank you for writing to us. This has been very old. I think we're going to close the ticket. I'm like, what? You never responded to me. So it's a pathetic uh, uh, customer support. But this is not the first time. One of my friends got duped with Binance. Uh, he had some coins over there. And once he logged in, he saw some transactions, which he never did. And then, unfortunately, like Manny said, this is the problem of not owning your own keys. And uh, my recommendation, if you have enough that you would uh, care and, and would not like to lose, maybe do a self custody of your uh, of these assets. Right. Uh, that's only I can say. Otherwise, not your keys, not your coins. That's uh, the motto. But Coinbase is the most reputed. US exchange uh, or regulated US exchanges. And if this is the issue with Coinbase, we can all imagine what could be happening with other exchanges. So the best is use it, buy it, because not all exchanges will serve uh, US customers. So unfortunately, we don't have too many choices. So I have to use it, but you know, when you get sufficient amount, that you will lose your sleep if that disappear. Uh, do a self custody. Okay. 
So we are talking about Bitcoin. Last update, a big update to Bitcoin um, blockchain happened in 2017. Oh, that was a nasty one. There was a lot of back and forth. There's a lot of uh, name calling, a lot of fights among the developers and the miners and the validators. Thankfully, this time, none of those things happened. There were no fireworks this time. There were no back and forth this time. There were no separate conference happening in New York this, uh, for, for this one. Very smooth. Taproot upgrade. Last one, like I said, the, the, the 2017 was SegWit upgrade. After that, the big upgrade is, will be happening in November, uh, which is a Taproot upgrade. So we should see what happens to Bitcoin after that. It's gonna, so there are a few improvements that will be happening in this. First is to make it more private. Uh, even though, uh, you know, Bitcoin, like I said, it's, it's a pseudonymous. So, but still there are some information that you can glean and get some idea about what sort of a transaction is happening, right? Hey, is this transaction coming from an individual or is this transaction coming from an institution? Looking at the metadata of the transaction, you can try to guess some of those things. So with a new upgrade, that will become almost impossible to guess. Uh, so that will be more private. So higher on a privacy scale. It's gonna be a little faster it's gonna enable the use cases wherein one particular transaction has to be signed by thousand users. There could be use cases like that. And it will also introduce a little more scripting capabilities called tap script on Bitcoin. So today Bitcoin does only the blockchain, Bitcoin blockchain is used for one thing and one thing only, and it does that great which is to maintain the ledger. That's it, doesn't do much. Ethereum does a lot more. Not only you can just maintain the transactions in the ledger, you could create a lending platform. You could create uh, a decent exchange on top of it. You can write smart contracts on top of it. Can do anything in Bitcoin. But with this tap script, we may be able to do some of those things on top of Bitcoin blockchain itself. So this does increase the, you know, create little more use cases for Bitcoin. So we got to see. Uh, I'm excited about this. It's a uh, big upgrade after four years and no more bloodshed this time. Pretty smooth. They came up with a very nice way of, uh, you know, uh, rolling in this upgrade there's going to be no fork last time we had a fork bitcoin and bitcoin cash this time it's a soft fork so no two separate chains nothing else many says buy in centralized exchange move to your own wallet if you're not trading exactly if you do, if you have no need to sell right now or you don't intend to sell in you know in near future you're not buying and selling. You're just buying and holding it. Hold it in your external wallet. Hold it in your own wallet. Don't leave it on exchange wallet. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Coinbase is, is an evil. I'm saying what if you get hacked? What if you become a victim of a phishing attack and kind of a end up giving your credentials to a hacker. No, that's not a Coinbase problem. Okay. So I might, because crypto provide us an ability to move it out, I'd rather move it out. You know, lest I should be, uh, become careless and, and give away and, you know, my own credentials. Number two, exchanges could be hacked as well. Mt. Gox, what, $400, $500 million hack. And then we have seen many other exchanges. They can get hacked too. So it's not that they are, they're dishonest or their intent is bad or they're evil, but these are the realities of life. 
someone could hack my laptop put a key logger on my uh, laptop and there we go anything that i type www.coinbase.com sorry i go to pro.coinbase.com and then the next would be my username password i'm gone so for my own protection why not i actually move it out from exchange yeah i'm i'm not a favor of leaving everything on exchange sam sharing uh, sharing balance article what's that about is today amc will accept cryptos other than bitcoin movie theater so for amc has been uh, i know they they've been jumping into everything uh amc ceo has been catering to uh wall street bets now they are um, catering to crypto i mean they they're focusing on this particular age group right um from my part i think in the future there could be many companies who will be accepting stable coins right so that shouldn't be too far away that future will not be far away but accepting other coins even if they accept i wouldn't want to uh, use it uh, to buy goods right because of the taxation issues nothing to do with any uh, crypto or or the transaction speed i'm like even if the bitcoin is being accepted and you're doing it on a lightning network means the transactions will get settled in a second and it is pretty cheap it's like less than a uh, pen or uh, the fraction of pennies but every time i do that i do keep track of those transactions to report it to irs i'm not going to take that headache but it does get a good uh, press release and it gets an eyeball it does bring up a profile of that company in eyes of uh, new investors so why not it doesn't harm you saying oh we accept it just that no one will maybe you know very few people will be using it so what tesla did the same thing i don't know if anyone actually bought a uh, would buy a tesla car using bitcoin so for me the bigger issue is the whole taxation problems so okay i see another question prabhat says i'm new to crypto wallet recently started investing but not much so what do you mean move it out you mean sell okay so man is is uh, spawning okay so, yeah so it is uh, it is not sell it is called uh, send or i think it's called withdraw uh, in depending on what exchange you are in in pro.coinbase.com it says you withdraw means you withdraw those wallets or withdraw those coins and move it will tell you okay where you wanted to send it to you can send it to another uh, wallet and give the address of that wallet saying okay move my coins from this to the other wallet and that's the wallet which you control and so then there are so software so wallets as well coin as sorry go ahead so i am in coinbase so what do you do in coinbase so coinbase has got two uh, applications one is accessible via coinbase.com yeah and then there is another one which is accessible via pro.coinbase.com so which one you are on uh, coinbase.com okay so i don't know in a coinbase.com do you see an option for withdrawal or send many says it's it's called send i mean i have never explored i mean i always saw buy and sell maybe if it's there i can look for it then yeah so i have not used uh, coinbase uh, i've used pro.coinbase.com um i don't know if coinbase allows and again because i have not used it so i don't know i might have to go back and check hey we back this is this is many i i can answer it because i use it i mean oh, even sure, if i don't like it i do i i do use it even if i don't like it just because of you know i have to get my fee at somehow in the system right <laughs> um that's the only reason i'm using coinbase is to put 
you know, fiat into something and then I move it out. <laughs> exactly. um, that's the only thing I'm doing with Coinbase. Um, to, I think it was Prabhat. So if you go into um, the idea, the term doesn't matter, but the idea is if when you, when, when you sell, you're obviously converting, you're converting to some extent your coin into, in most cases, US dollar or some stable coin. When you withdraw or send, you're not converting anything. You're just moving it from one wallet to another wallet. So when I say uh, you go into Coinbase and uh, move it to your wallet, that's a short way to say is go into Coinbase and basically send yourself the same coin. So if you bought some Bitcoin, send yourself that Bitcoin. So there is no selling or conversion into or, or trade into anything else. It's just moving it out, technically speaking, from one wallet to the next wallet. So what that makes sense? Next wallet? Say again. So what will be the next wallet? Like one more, like what will be the next? Oh, wallet? oh, no, no. Well, uh, <laughs> but Vivek, maybe that's a good thing if you want. Uh, and nice to meet you, by the way, first time I joined. Uh, uh, yeah, I think wallets, that's a big topic. It's huge. And, and for me, that's actually the heart of the decentralized technology. Not these exchanges. We, always talk, we talk a lot about these exchanges because that's who we're interacting with. But the real heart of decentralization is the fact that each individual has in his pocket his bank. <laughs> that's, that's the magic of it. So when I say wallet, uh, I can give you some names. Coinbase has a wallet. So if you're using an iPhone or a smartphone, you can go and use a Coinbase wallet, which is different than Coinbase uh, app. Right, Vivek? Yes. So Coinbase has, so let me just share this. I just pulled up a, oh, cool. I talked about wallets earlier. So it doesn't matter. We can talk about it now again. So the oh. concept here is this, uh, Prabhat. So when you're buying it on Coinbase, it is sitting in Coinbase wallet, right? So with your username and password, you have access to that wallet and you go ahead and you basically withdraw and sell it, right? But then the question is that I'm dependent on Coinbase. If Coinbase is down, I can't access it, which has happened. People wanted to sell. When the markets went down, Coinbase was uh, just under load. People couldn't access it. So what Manny says is good thing is you move it out of Coinbase. You put it in your own wallet. You become your own bank. So now your question is, what are those wallets? There are multiple wallets available for Bitcoin, right? Exodus. So then wallets are two types one is a software wallet which means you have it on your phone you have it on your laptop right exodus is there i think that's a very widely used electrum i've heard of and coinbase also has a wallet that you can download on your phone right when you so, but in all these wallets what happen when you download on your phone or on your, on your laptop you will be uh, asked to create, uh, you know, there'll be a, a, a 24 or 12 word pass phrase that you'll have to remember. So every wallet will come up with the one private key and then a public key. And to restore that private key, you need to have that uh, 12 word pass phrase, right? When you set up that wallet, it'll tell you what those 12 words or 24 words, depending on what kind of wallet it is keep it safe, and then you have that wallet. Then you go to your Coinbase website, log in into that and send, say, send it to this wallet address, right? Each wallet has got its address. And then when you look at that wallet, you will see after some time that your coins have moved over to that wallet. Now you control that wallet because you, and you only you knows that passphrase. If anyone else comes to know that passphrase, they can withdraw it. They can just create the same private key and then move the transaction. So these are the software wallet. Better than leaving it on exchange, but still software means it's sitting on your laptop or is sitting on your cell phone. Laptop, can you can have a malware on a laptop, key loggers on the laptop, et cetera, et cetera. So what I prefer is that one more step, which is a hardware wallet. In case of a hardware wallet, there are two which are most famous. One comes from Trezor, other comes from Ledger. 
So let's look at ledger and treasure. Okay. Yeah, I think before you you withdraw, you really need to um, practice uh, this stuff, right? Like get, like basically familiarize yourself with um, with different um, wallet technologies and and also uh, uh, practice uh, the security, right? Go, right? go through the go through the um, the back the restore um, process a couple of times to make sure everything is, is, it looks good, right? Uh, before you, you, you do anything major. <laughs> yeah, don't move um, everything, uh, uh, you're yeah. one go. Just try exactly. to do a small one, see how it appears before you move the another one. Yeah, I, I will never move everything. Yeah, I just yeah want... it's more about your, um, the thing about self-custody is it's more about your, your whole security setup and your process, right? And right. you have to be, comfortable with it like you don't have to like my process is very complicated but i am very confident at executing it so i don't i don't see a problem with it but if you're just starting out you probably shouldn't have a super complicated setup because you you may not be confident at executing it and it may end up creating more problems <laughs> right um so good but, thing about about these uh wallets is hey no one else controls it you are the owner the bad thing about these wallets is, hey, no lens controls it, you are the owner and you mess up, there is no recourse to it. So it goes both ways. So I have a question here. So let's say you move the coins to the wallet and then the price of the coins like move up or down. Okay. Yeah. Then it will still reflect on my wallet, right? Like wallet coins. So, so here's the thing. So actually what moves into the wallet is basically... Uh, you know, is a what you have is that nothing you, really moves into yeah, your wallet. Really moves, everything, yeah, everything is recorded <laughs> on the blockchain. Just hold the private key. <laughs> everything is funny. recorded on the blockchain. <laughs> yes, the 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 wallet is just your key, um, it, it, and, and your key is derived from your your seed phrase, and your addresses are derived from your key. So everything is it just holds the key. Yeah, that's it just holds the private. Basically, key. what that is. Yeah. yeah. I think that's probably one of the most complex aspects. And that's why I say it's such a critical aspect to really understand, to understand the decentralized economy that we're building here um, is exactly what James just said, is, is, is that we always think that people always ask me, so that means that your coins are in your phone? No, they're no, not. No. <laughs> I just have information on my phone that, acts, that helps me access these coins that are, and honestly, somewhere out there in code, somewhere written somewhere. That's all it is, it's code, it's code. <laughs> That's why people have a hard time to understand. It's just code. So my phone just has an application that knows how to read that code. Um, one of the big things that I've noticed that helps people get there, although it's a little bit technical um, um, for the new ones, is really to go into an explorer Okay, I'm using those words. I don't know what the level of knowledge is here, but I know that showing an explorer with a wallet, you take your own wallet and you put it in there in an explorer, you see everything that happened on that wallet. So whoever has that number, right? Here, go ahead, Vivek, explain. Because that's really, that's very important. We don't, if you don't understand this, you're playing with fire. <laughs> so, so this is, where the Bitcoin Explorer is. And you have this Explorer for, for every uh, public blockchain. Right? You can go to each scan uh, for every uh, blockchain in the Explorer. Now, this is why we call this as a public, right? I can look at what all transactions have happened here, right? Who is sent what BTC, which address the BTCs are going to. Now, if I have, uh, I want to look at, say, if you, you send me saying, okay, send this to my, this wallet. Wallet means this is an address. I can just copy this address and uh, I can see, okay, what all has happened on this address. I can simply come and check everything, right? It'll tell me, okay, maybe this has address has only transacted one time, but if this address has transacted 20 times, I will see all the transactions in here. So everything, is on a computer network, is, the, is on the network around the, all the distributed computers. So, so all the, it's just a ledger that we say, this address moves so many Bitcoins 
It's just the entry, it's a ledger, entry in a ledger. That's it, the, that's all the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain is. What we have in our wallet is a key to sign these transactions when we transmit saying, okay, I want to move, let's say uh, 0.01 Bitcoin. I have to first confirm that I am indeed the owner of that. The only way for me to confirm, say move this from this particular wallet to somewhere else is I need to sign the transaction with the digital sig signature and which, for which I also need to have a private key. What the wallet holds is a private key. What the software wallet or a hardware wallet which holds is a private key, right? That's it, the coins are not there. The coins is nothing but an entry in the ledger. There is no physical coin. So it's an, it's an entry uh, in, the, in the ledger. So uh, if let's say you want to move your coins from some exchange to a software wallet, mm -hmm. that software wallet can is also like, a, like you will also provide some credentials, like, like username and password to log into that. And then that is also susceptible to attacks. Right? So that software wallet is sitting on your laptop. So number one, always download it from a, a authentic site, right? If you're downloading it, say Exodus, or Electrum, download it from Electrum's website. Don't go and download from CNET or somewhere else, right? Meaning these Exodus and this one, they don't have a server. It's like everything is on the laptop or like phone only. Uh, I think this is, yeah, this is you'll download Electrum on your, on your laptop. It doesn't have any backend server or something like that. No. So basically you download it on your laptop and then it sits on your laptop and uh, you basically log in, but then it's on a laptop. Okay, and if, if laptop crashes, that means it's gone. It's not gone. You can recover it. That's where the past phrase come into picture. I talked about 12 words or 24 words. So if your laptop is gone, you can just go and download it on any other laptop. It will ask you, is this a new wallet or do you want to recover from somewhere else? Or you want to recover the, the some other wallet? You said, I want to recover my existing wallet. Means I want to just create the same private key, it'll ask you what are those 12 words or 24 words past phrase. And you have to give it exactly the same way. Your everything will start to show up because just that it got the key, it'll go and read the blockchain and say, oh, against this address, all these coins, the entries were there in the blockchain. So that means um, those money that is stored, it is stored in that Exodus some centralized server or somewhere, right? No, Exodus, no. So there is nothing stored. So Exodus wallet will go and just look at the blockchain, the Bitcoin blockchain, and see what are the entries against this particular address in that Bitcoin blockchain. There'll be entries, and again, Bitcoin is a different one. It works on uh, unspent transaction outputs. So look at how many have been spent, how many have been received, what's the net balance, it will show you. It's not a centralized server. So Bitcoin blockchain is distributed, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes some of these wallets, they require, um, like the only part I would say is centralized would be the, the actual node, because like maybe you're, you're, uh, you're running out on your phone or something. So it may not be feasible to run an actual Bitcoin node. Like you could do some research like on, on like what that is, right? So it, the, the, the true kind of decentralized way to use Bitcoin is to run a node. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then you, you've got uh, control over everything, right? Then you don't even need to depend on like some backend somewhere. But if you're using a lightweight wallet, then chances are uh, it's gonna be talking to a central server which has the node, right? Um, and, and that happens with Ethereum a lot just cause it's, it's pretty heavy to run a, a node. It's not too bad, I, I'm running a node, <laughs> Ethereum node, right? So, but like, if you're using MetaMask, then it's it's definitely talking to Infura, right? So, so um, James, baby steps. Okay. <laughs> I don't want someone to just scare away, right? So I see. Right okay. Now, okay. Hey, from yeah, from exchange, sense. let's move it to software wallet. Maybe then move yeah, yeah. To hardware wallet. Running the node will come later. That's like a purist uh, idea. Makes so sense. I, makes I completely sense. agree with you. So. Thank you. so so I think one thing that one one wallet that I find user friendly again for starters, right? Because people understand that is that you can get, for instance, MetaMask, 
right? Mm -hmm. And you, you, you install it as an extension to your browser, yeah. okay? So just do it as an extension, you go to, you know, you, if you're using Chrome, or I use Brave specifically, but any anyone that I guess has it. So download, and you see MetaMask, right? Download it as an extension, open it, and as Vivek said, it's going to ask you to create a password. And then you have it on your browser, and most of the things you do is on your browser. Play with it, because I think it's a good user-friendly way to understand how these soft wallets work without having another device like your phone being into the mix here. Because sometimes I guess maybe people get confused about the phone and the computer. Leave everything in the computer, install MetaMask extension, and start using that and see how you can add funds, remove funds, send funds, and participate in you know, DeFi and all of that. But and that's an easy, yeah, easy way. Well, MetaMask is for Ethereum chain. Uh, it's not uh, just. No, you can, use, you can use it for BSC. Oh, yeah, for BSC, but not for Bitcoin. And, oh, no, no, not Bitcoin. <laughs> Can Not you spell yet. Spell it. What's the spelling? It's a meta mask. M e t a m a s k. So okay. I do. Yeah, I got it. It comes as a Chrome browser. I have it as a Chrome browser extension. Right. Okay. So these are all software wallets. So for for Ethereum and ERC twenty token, uh, ERC twenty uh, tokens, I use MetaMask, right? But software wallet is one layer of protection. The best one is a hardware wallet because again, software wallets mean someone could, I just want to finish the whole wallet discussion, right? <laughs> so we talked about software wallet, then there come hardware wallets in which, you know, the private key is not even now on my laptop because my laptop is susceptible to malware attack. Maybe my laptop gets hacked. So these are the hardware wallets in which the private key actually sits in this hardware and you keep the hardware, you know, don't, it's not connected to my laptop. It's only when I set it up, it creates an address. And then I go to Coinbase and say, move all these to this address. So the entry gets into blockchain saying, so many um, coins moved from this address, which was my Coinbase address to this address, which is my hardware um, uh, address. And uh, then, these wallets come up with an app in which you can actually see when you connect to your laptop, you can see what's the amount, you know, the number of coins you have and many other things. And then that's it. Then I just disconnect this hardware device, keep it in a bank safe deposit box. Then even if my laptop gets hacked, if someone wants to spend any coins, they need to physically connect this device because the private key is stored in this device. So they have to physically connect this device to the internet or to, uh, to the USB port, uh, which is, they can't. So I, I, this is from my perspective is step number three, step number, sorry, two, software wallet then move to hardware wallet. And uh, you know, then at least I'm saying that even if my laptop is hacked, still no one has access to this hardware device. But that's a, I would say a highest level for now as an individual investor. Thank you. All right, so I see, um, bro, you can only, uh, moving to your own wallet, we talked about it. Uh, I see a question for Zifty on the same withdrawal topic, I'm debating between the Ledger Nano X and the Nano S, the Bluetooth, one sounds convenient, but afraid it can be hacked. Do you have any experience or do you do software wallet? No, so I do uh, a hardware wallet and I have experience with both Nano X as well as Nano S. I bought Nano S in 2017 because there was no X, uh, but the Nano S, the memory is very less. For example, you can create a Bitcoin wallet on Ledger Nano S. You can create an Ethereum wallet and maybe one more and that's it. It has the memory is only that much. So when I want you to add additional wallets uh, on the Ledger Nano S, it says I don't have a memory space. So I have to order a Nano X, which has got more memory space. So then I can have a Bitcoin wallet in it, Ethereum wallet in it, Polkadot wallet in it, uh, Cardano wallet in, in the same OneDrive. So that's a 
one different. That's why I actually bought Ledger Nano X as well. I'm not using its Bluetooth stuff because I don't have to transact it. I'm, I'm not a trader. So I don't have to be really always connected to this. I moved my funds and now this is, you know, sitting in somewhere in my house. That's it. So that was uh, my reason why I bought Nano X because it has a capability to hold more wallets than the what Ledger Nano S had. Hopefully so that uh, the X, uh, so the X is, is so it's battery powered, or like does it charge up or something? Uh, no, I'm no. I don't have any experience with X because I I I'm a believer that the simpler the better. Well, I don't even I, I I've only recently started to use uh, um, Ledger because I've always been using Trezor for the past not... five five years, but. Um, Actually, it does. It looks like we might have some battery because, you know, I'm not connected. Yeah, it does. Otherwise, the Bluetooth. It has to, right? Otherwise, yeah, how does uh, the Bluetooth, the Bluetooth would work? Bluetooth work. <laughs> um, it has to have a battery. But, but like, but like uh, yeah, so I, I, have the Nan, I have the Ledger Nano S, and, and yeah, you have to plug it in. It's definitely the net battery in there. But X, X has a battery. Yeah, but I've yeah. never used its Bluetooth. I mean, I don't want to just stay connected. Uh, Oh, on Bluetooth. One thing that I noticed in, in the difference between the, the Ledger and the Trezor, and again, I'm not using it for trading at all, but sometimes, you know, if you want to uh, connect wallet on some DeFi, you have more connectivity options with Ledger than with Trezor. Oh, okay. Yeah, oh, with like, Trezor. Oh, like for any, um... That's the only difference that I really found, right? I like Trezor just because I started with Trezor, uh, but my Ledger Nano is just sometimes, you know, like you own some weird you know, wallet and uh, you are a possible, like even like the, B the, the the Binance Smart Chain, you can actually connect the, the, Binance, the Binance Smart Chain web wallet, you can connect it directly to your ledger, for instance, right? Which you cannot do with the Trezor yet. Or maybe they changed it, I don't know. Things like that. That's the only difference that I really found is like the ledger has more compatibility. Yeah, it seems right like there. it because you can. I, I don't think with Trezor you probably can't even do uh, Solana and and Terra, right? As of nope. now, and nope. uh, is Ledger um, is is Ledger compatible with fifteen fifty nine now? Because Trezor you can't do fifteen fifty nine transactions. You can only do the legacy, <laughs> like that. That's I, yeah, I don't know. kind of a bummer, you know right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, fifteen fifty nine. I, I haven't. Purpose. I haven't checked. Uh, I don't think I've I've sold anything after or moved anything after 1559 was done i moved it to <laughs> Ave. i haven't moved in with my hardware ledger i moved it to Ave. yeah so, with hardware they, they have to set the legacy they still have to use the legacy type um like with the metamask software wallet you can do 1559 but if you the minute you do the hardware it's no longer it downgrades it to legacy <laughs> um and it's causing some problems with some DeFi apps that's for sure yeah. Um, one nice feature, one nice feature is the Trezor and the Exodus uh, wallet. So the Exodus software wallet and the Trezor hardware wallet, uh, they they work very well nicely together. So I have them paired together. So I'm actually using my Exodus front end to read my Trezor hard wallet. So that's something that works actually very well. Those two together. Hmm. Yeah, I think even MetaMask can also connect to uh, yeah the Trezor yeah. Ledger. I, I, yeah, I, I, yeah. Where is it, Roger? I only have Ledger. It's it just that Exodus has such a such a nice GUI, right? <laughs> I also nice like GUI. the way that Trezor handles um, the uh, the the passphrase Connected. thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. Security, um, because uh -huh. I, I I need I, I don't use the standard like the I use the seed phrase plus the passphrase. Mm -hmm. um so that i can create create decoy wallets and I, that's getting pretty advanced into like wallet security right. <laughs> but you can set up decoy wallets uh, on these hardware devices so like for example if somebody's holding a gun to your head um you can give them a uh, a a either a pin or a passphrase or you can tell them here's my seed phrase mm -hmm. and then they just take it and then they wow. put it in and then they'll see some money in there right Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but but that's not your actual wallet so so <laughs> right so when you when you open up uh, your trezor um you can put in a, a any passphrase right is is a valid passphrase so you have to put in the correct one and then it, it creates a whole new 
private key for you, and that private key is your actual private key. Uh, like like Ledger supports it too, but I don't like the way they're doing it. But right, um, but that's pretty advanced security. That's that's uh, important if you're if you're really serious about uh, <laughs> storing that's storing cool. uh, crypto. I'll, I'll yeah. check it out. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Like you yeah. said, if somebody comes with a brick and hits me on the head. Well, I also <laughs> like, for example, if you store the seed phrase inside a bank safe deposit box, right? Um, it's it's not it's not very likely that somebody is going to break into it, but it has happened before. So what, mm -hmm. what has happened, um, some of these banks, when they're renovating, they ship all of these um, like they, they will probably drill open all the boxes and ship everything over to a holding facility that you can, you can look it up. It's, it has happened before, like bank of America has done it before. Um, and then, and then, and then they'll ship it back. Right. Well, who knows what, who's going to look at it, Right. So, so yeah. the thing is, if you set up a decoy wallet, what you can do is you can actually write a program to monitor that address. And if you see movement, Right. of that decoy wallet, then that's your canary, right? That's like, okay, somebody mm -hmm. just try to hack into my, my decoy wallet. I better like move or I better like do something, right? You know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah, just it's better excellent. security excellent. overall. Yeah, it's, it's excellent, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, th these are the challenges that come that if you become your own bank, then you have to make sure that how do you secure your own bank? Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the reason on this. <laughs> it, it is good like as well as say, scary. You know, certain coins don't work with certain wallets. So you start adding wallets, wallets, wallets. And then when you end up having like 20, 25 different wallets and seed traces, you go crazy. <laughs> You're like, how am I going to manage that? I'm not that much worried actually. And I think most people are not as worried as being the, the wallet. Being yeah, stolen. that's why it's better to have one seed phrase with multiple passphrases, right? So yeah. then your seed phrase is, it, it can be combined with any number of passphrases to generate different unique wallets uh, so then so then you, you wouldn't have to manage 25 seed phrases right and and, it, and potentially it gives you better security too because now you have two factor security right. as opposed yeah. to just a single yeah. factor i need to dig into this decoy wallet uh, and how exactly that works but that sounds really interesting i do have to enter my passphrase when i use my ledger um no, oh, that's the pin. That's the, that's the, you're sorry, about the, the pin. Password. That's the pin. Yes. You're yeah, right. the pin is different. This passphrase, uh, the pin is is uh, something that unlocks your wallet. Like you can think of it as like uh, maybe they've got some encryption mm -hmm. that encrypts the the, the 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 private key, and then the pin is used to decrypt that. But um, but what the passphrase is, it's actually. And you can think of it as an extra phrase or extra word that gets added to the end of your seed phrase. So it totally becomes part of your private key, right? So it is completely an intrinsic part of the private key. That's what yeah. the path. So when you don't set a passphrase, it by default uses an empty string. Um, so it combines your seed phrase with an empty string if you don't give it a passphrase, but if you give it anything, like it can be like, I think up to like a certain number of characters or something, mm -hmm. then that gets mixed together with your private key to actually, um, I mean, with the seed phrase to actually derive your private key. So you can have an infinite number of different passphrases, right? Almost, I mean, not infinite, but like a large number of passphrases. Um, and, and you can, you can, any of them, any one of them is valid. So there is not not even a way that password that passphrase is not stored anywhere, right? So you can you can just say any passphrase and it's it's technically a valid wallet and and it's believable, right? <laughs> like yeah. that's plausible deniability. Like there's no there's no way for them to prove that this isn't the correct password. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's yeah, it's, yeah. it's brilliant. The system is actually really yeah. So good. I uh, yeah. Um, oh. Thanks for the pointer. I'll need to then go back and look at this whole decoy wallet uh, concept and try to use it. Yeah, that's interesting. I'll try that too. Uh, I think Zift has one more question. It is with Ledger Nano X. Nobody talked about Bluetooth enabled drive. Even though we don't use it and just hook it directly to our computer, it is Bluetooth capable, waiting for signals, right? Yeah, but I don't know if we all, all, on the device, I actually have to press something to actually make it l now listen or, or or wait for signals. Like you have to turn your Bluetooth on, on the phone. 
uh, maybe on the device itself, I'll have to turn it on. Uh, number two is to even get into this ledger NOX, like I have to type in a six digit pin. So that's additional level of security. Without typing in that six digit pin, I cannot get into this. So for example, if I forget my six digit pin, and I will have to order a new device, or new device or probably will give me a few tries and it will reset everything, something like that. So, so Zifty, uh, even if I leave my Bluetooth signal on and someone else has um, this Ledger Nano X app, probably they would, won't have my pin. Again, I've not tried it. I'm also thinking loud here. Yeah, I don't know the Bluetooth. I don't know if that's, uh, it, it, I don't know if it's actually a security risk, but to me, it's just unnecessary, right? I don't really use it. So I, I just don't want anything extra for, for like a, a device that's supposed to be secure because the more, more features definitely will give you more attack surfaces, right? But I don't know, like it's, I, I think it's reasonably secure, right? For, um, because Bluetooth, I mean, you, you gotta, um, you gotta uh, 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 approve all the, all, like if you're pairing with, uh, with your phone, I mean, at the protocol level, at the protocol level, there's uh, some, some stuff there, but if you don't need it, why, why get it, right? Yeah, That's exactly. My... <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't, right? I, I don't open um, my, these hardware wallet for months together. The only time when I open it is when I have to transfer it, which is like, maybe, you know, I'll open it once in a few months to see, okay, I want to move from my exchange to this. I don't, I don't trade in and out of it. Then I'm like, I don't need to have it with this Bluetooth. I, I call uh, uh, an analogy would be my web wallet on my, um, um, what do you call it? The, the, my, my hard wallet on my savings account, right? Like in the bank, that's my savings account. You only go there once in a while when you really need something, yeah. right? And then your other wallets are basically your normal everyday Thank account. You. Yeah. Backing account, yeah. Thank you. Checking, checking account. That's the term I was looking for. Yeah. So that's a that's a way to an analogy with with the traditional world, which is savings versus checking. Yeah. Just don't compare the percentages or don't compare the yield. That <laughs> two different ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I saw. I saw yesterday, James. That's for you. I saw yesterday, you get twenty percent now on Anchor for you uh, for um, UST. Twenty percent. Twenty percent on a state. On the stable coin on Anchor. So, so this is uh, again. I think yeah. I was looking at yeah. Aave, and then at one point of a time, I saw seven percent on USDC on Aave. Okay, and then I wanted to deposit it, and my transactions were just failing. Uh, you know, I was to deposit from a Meta because I had uh, I moved it to my MetaMask, and then I said deposit, and that wasn't going through for whatever reason. I, and I had a little tough time. It was like midnight. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. And when I, next day when I got to it, it was like 3.6%. Now, my question to you, uh, James, and maybe Manny, if you have been dealing a lot more in DeFi, uh, especially on the stable coins, does it change so much? Because the reason is- Well, here, here's, here's the thing, right? Here, here's my, my take on it. I mean, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 lending is pretty much all I do <laughs> day in, day out. So uh, my, my take, here's, here's, the rational take on this, right? So in order for you to earn a certain percentage, somebody has to borrow at a higher percentage. True. Right? I mean, I mean, there's there's really no way around it. I mean, you can you can yeah. maybe dance around it with a little bit of uh, stuff, but but it pretty much comes down to to supply and demand, right? So somebody has to be willing to borrow at a higher rate um, if you're getting a certain rate. And and, and basically um, and, and the yield comes really from the borrower, right? Correct. That's where the yield come from, comes from. So with Anchor, so you know, you know what Anchor is, right? The Terra uh, platform. The Terra is that? Oh, oh, you, okay, yeah. So the the so if somebody if they're if they're paying you twenty percent, um, then the platform must have enough borrowers. Um, that are willing to pay more than twenty percent because that's where the yield is co coming from, right? Now, now, why do they have borrowers? Well, right now, it's a combination of um, it's pretty much yield farming, right? That that comes down to that. So they also have so basically as a borrower on 
anchor, you're giving up some staking yield, but you're earning, um, you're earning these anchor uh, okay. tokens, right? And, and they 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 are worth uh, uh, some 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 money, right? And then that yield is actually greater than twenty whatever twenty. I think if you're borrowing, you gotta pay more than twenty percent. Yeah, so whatever. you're paying like twenty, maybe twenty three, right. twenty four. And right. then your um, your yield farming gives you thirty or something, right? Or more than that, maybe. So then, then the borrowers are kind of incentivized to go and take out these loans, um, and then in the process, because they have to lock up collateral, and the collateral they're locking up, I think, is is either a bonded Ethereum or bonded Luna, which those two are all yield producing tokens. So they're giving up the the the, uh, the basically the, the yield on these underlying tokens in exchange for the yield farming from Anchor. So there's a little bit of uh, a little bit of a uh, 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 dynamic stuff going on there. But ultimately, what you're what you're getting as a lender on that platform is basically um, what the borrowers are paying, and then they're in being incentivized through uh, Anchor uh, by a, a yield farming. And there is really no way around that. So one, the minute they stop the yield farming, the twenty percent is going to disappear. So the the thing is, um, the uh, Ave. The reason you're seeing three percent is because uh, of the fact that um, Ave and compound, compound those are so. Um, I would say in, in in DeFi terms, those those are like very like building block protocols these days like nobody really like as a, as an individual you almost you almost uh, uh, you, you're probably never going to actually directly use compound so what com- compound is becoming more like almost like a back end to other defi protocols oh okay so like for example like notional that's right that's the, the reserve <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so like i i work in notional and then and then um, what we do is um, when somebody makes a deposit into notional uh, we right away wrap it into a, like a compound C token. Oh. Um, and then, so you're earning some yield. It's almost like your Fidelity core account. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's Got almost it. becoming like, it's crazy. It's crazy. The, no, direction. So the reason I got surprised was that within the Aave itself, when I, because my intent was to move it to um, Celsius because they gave 8.8%, right? But mm-hmm. when I looked at Aave, I'm like, it's giving me 7% which is decent enough, then I don't want to move to a centralized uh, party. I'd rather move it to Aave. But my transaction wasn't going through. I thought oh, I'll do it tomorrow. And tomorrow when I looked at it the next day, that 7% had dropped to 3.5%. Then I'm like, now maybe I'll move back to Celsius. I'm like, within Aave itself, not even comparing with other platform. That were like, you oh, fixed rate, day? you need fixed rate lending. You wait for us. We'll, we'll we're shipping. <laughs> like within the day, it has gone on four percent. Okay, I'm we're going we're back to Celsius. I understand the risk with it. It's like, you need fixed rate lending. That's what you need. Exactly. Like, <laughs> so we're it's we're, a difference of almost four percent overnight. I'm like, gosh. Uh, so that that actually was surprising for me. Yeah, because demand, right? It's all dynamic. It's like money market. That's what that is, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, you, there's nothing that stabilizes the. If you if you do want a little bit of if you so you're gonna you're only lending, right? You're not borrowing. Are you borrowing as well? So what I did, uh, so I because I'm a holder of Ethereum, I have no intent to sell some of that. So I moved that to Aave, and okay. uh, deposited that and took a USDC loan against it, which is like three point seven percent. So it cost me 3.7% to take a loan on USDC. That USDC I can deposit to Celsius and earn 8.8%. So that see. was my game plan. I see, I see. So I'm like, no, not I'm daily. 5%, it, it... 5%. And anyway, that Ethereum, which I have, was sitting in my wallet. So I don't intend to sell it. So let's, you know, take a collect, put that as a collateral and take out a loan on USDC. And I'm doing only USDC because I don't want to have another level of crypto volatility, right? So I just borrowed USDC and put it out in in uh, BlockFi or Celsius, uh, where I can make more than what I'm paying to Aave. 
So okay, so you're doing interest rate arbitrage. That's what you're doing, right? Yeah. yeah now the <laughs> interest in arbitrage and interest in uh, arbitraging of a risk as well, because that those are the centralized parties, right? <laughs> so yeah. So I, if you're doing that, I I yeah I think um, it, it may be a little bit uh, because the the lending is definitely not stabilized, right? So if you're borrowing, then then it's actually trickier. Then you really have to wait for uh, some kind of fixed rate product. But if you're lending, if you want to earn like stable yield, um, you can potentially use Barnbridge, which uh, stabilizes the um, the yield uh, for you. Um, the yield uh, it, it is right at a, um, at a cost, James. At a cost. What was that? At a cost, do they stabilize? Do stabilize it because everything. Oh, how does it do that? So is that the question? Like, how do they do no, it? It's just saying like, it's not free to use Barnbridge and to get a stable rate. Well, the when you use Barnbridge, you have to decide if you want a stable but lower rate or unstable but potentially higher rate, right? Okay. So you, you have to decide which which side you want to be on. It's, it's kind of like a risk tokenizing yeah. protocol where it, you shift, you're shifting risk around, right? Because... The, re the, the thing you're seeing, the fluctuation that you're seeing, that's interest rate risk. That yeah. is the price of money that's fluctuating right there, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you can think of interest rate as the price of money that's basically fluctuating up and down. So it's just like the price that's fluctuating up and down, right? The, re the reason right. rates fluctuating like that is also based on supply and demand. So what Barnbridge allows you to do is to shift that risk around. Mm -hmm. uh, basically have one pool that's really, really stable, but giving up most of the upside potential. So even if the rate goes up like crazy, you're not getting that. Uh, you're only getting, you're, you're pretty capped, um, but, but it's stable, like very stable, right? Um, but the other side of the pool is, is, is very much fluctuating wildly <laughs> and it can turn negative too. If you go on there, uh, I think a couple of days ago, one of the pools actually turned negative. So you're paying, <laughs> you're, wow. your, your, your capital is being used to subsidize the senior pool. Cause I mean, you, 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 you basically chose to take, take on that risk, right? So if the rate drops drastically, then you're going to be, you're going to pay up. <laughs> I mean, it's like, um, but, but when the rate is going up like crazy, you're also going to be receiving like two, two or three times the, the rate um, because uh, you're essentially there's some some leverage because the seniors are giving up their yield. It's a it's an interesting dynamic for sure. Um, I, I mean, if you're really into some of the crazy DeFi stuff, this would be <laughs> good stuff to, to wrap your head around. <laughs> So I had a question on, on this whole DeFi because I was reading through, uh, I don't know, maybe I should put a link. So there was a good uh, deep dive into this whole taproot. Oh, oh DeFi and Cardano, really? I'm not doing no, that. No, 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 not, not the Cardano. No, I'm not talking about oh, Cardano. There okay. was a, oh, I think, oh, yeah. Oh, this came in today. This news came oh, in. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So this is, <laughs> this is what I want to, no, no, this, this was a good, uh, more technical, in-depth description on uh, this, um, Taproot uh, okay. upgrade. Uh, this was a, uh, it's not a blog post. Actually, you can download a file, which is almost 30 pages document, mm -hmm. which talks about Taproot and how the elliptical curve cryptography, uh, you know, now they're moving to Schnorr signatures and all that, and how that is different, how it's going to be made. Uh, for those who are software developers, I'm not the one. So some of the things I couldn't understand it. Oh, sorry, I think the message. I actually went to a Bitcoin meetup uh, and, and there were some, some people work actually working on Taproot. Um, yeah, so this Taproot. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to talk to them. No, so the whole source in nature has been yeah. in discussion since 2018. This was proposed by, uh, this Taproot was proposed by uh, Gregory Maxwell, one of the lead Bitcoin developer in 2018. And the work has been happening uh, since then. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto could have actually picked up this North signature because that is a much better way. Uh, but the thing was the German uh, cryptographer who actually came up with this Snor um, uh, signature concept had patented it. So they couldn't use it. They had to wait for the patent to expire. Patent expired in 2008. But because it was patented, not many of the innovations that happened, there were not much of a support on it. So then Satoshi Nakamoto couldn't use it. 
but it was always in the minds of the block uh, on, on the Bitcoin developer that we have to move to this North Signature once we have enough community around it because now the patent has expired, it has become open source. And that's why we had to wait for 10 more years and to bring in this North Signature. And until that time, they use the elliptical curve signature because this is makes it more private, makes it um, a much smaller in terms of a footprint, the transaction size is less and all that stuff. It's, a, it's crazy a great... that Satoshi Nakamoto remained anonymous, but still respected the, the patent law. That's pretty, that's pretty exactly. It's, it's like, why do that? It's like, why, it's, why do you it is patent, We can't use it because uh, it, it was a patented invention. Um, so it's like, we can't use right, 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 right. it to wait. But, you know, for those who are interested in getting in the details, I find it really exciting. Some of the things I couldn't understand, but those who are probably, you know, a little bit more deeper into technical cryptography, uh, this is a good, good read. It talks yeah, about I, I'm, I'm interested. I'm not a cryptographer, but I'm definitely interested. Yeah, so, like, so I, this I, is a I, link I posted. I, yeah. it's, it's a good document. I spent some time reading that. Now, the, in the end of this document, I also saw that because of now they're coming with the tap script, it is also part of this taproot upgrade. There were three changes going in, right? Snore signature, uh, uh, and then there's a tap script, which will now enable Bitcoin um, blockchain to actually have a little more smart contract-like capabilities, right? Now you can program when you're uh, the set of sending the transaction, now you can write a program against it. It's got its own scripting language. Now the question that I have with this team is, Bitcoin is known and it's very well established itself as a base layer in which you know it's it is pretty stable, fully decentralized, and all that stuff. Now, if it starts to have this uh, scripting capability, and we see, could there be an adoption of Bitcoin? Could Bitcoin be Ethereum challenger rather than you know Cardano or Solana or Polkadot of the world? Could this be could become a surprise for us to say? Hey, we were never even watching for Bitcoin to actually come and challenge uh, or for you know for this DeFi and uh, this smart contracts stuff. What's your um, well, I, I, I don't know. It's my opinion, right? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Nobody knows, right? I know. But knows. based yeah. on based on my understanding, um, the, the the thing is Ethereum's. Um, DeFi ecosystem is is really pretty developed. Like people people don't even know how complicated these smart contracts are. <laughs> like holy crap, these contracts are complicated. So so the thing is, these things take time to develop. They're not. I mean, even even let's just say right, Bitcoin or, or Cardano, whatever. Like right, they say okay, we got smart contracts now. Like or even better than Ethereum. Like whatever. Right, yeah. the, the contracts are really good. Well, it's still going to take time, right, to develop. That's take a long time, actually. These, these contracts are not, you can't rush them out. Um, so, so even if Ethereum were to stand still, like if there is no more new stuff, like people, people have decided, okay, Ethereum is, is, is a lost cause, right? <laughs> um, no more, like we're not going to develop anymore. That's it, done. It's still going to take, realistically speaking, a couple of years for uh, some of these protocols to even match what, uh, because you, you can't look at um, something like BSC or, or, or Polygon, because not only the, the protocol itself is, is more or less a copy pasta, the, all the contracts are also copy pasted, okay. right? The, the, there's not really anything crazy innovative. Like our notional, the, the product that I'm working on, we got copied. Like some 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 dude copied it and put it on to BSC. Uh, they only copied the V1, which kind of sucks. <laughs> so they haven't really copied the V2 yet. <laughs> but um, but you know what I'm saying? Like it's it's not really real. They're not pushing DeFi forward, and everything that's pushing DeFi forward is happening on Ethereum. So so my 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 thinking is it, it is possible for for them to come up with something that's great but it, it's going to take time to incubate and ethereum is also moving forward so they're they're really looking at a moving target so it's yeah. not so it's I, not a i have no doubt that ethereum will continue to be the king my question more related to the other challengers right right now no one is looking at bitcoin as a challenger everyone is talking about Oh, Ethereum challenger or Ethereum killer is going to be Polkadot or Cardano or Solana 
or Algorand, uh, but no one is talking about Bitcoin. So Ethereum will still be there. Could Bitcoin- well, Let's take a look at, um, so once it's out and, and once uh, we, we see some DeFi action, um, then, then we'll know, like Cardano, for example, right? There, there's a key issue that I feel like is gonna be a, a pretty problematic for, for advanced DeFi. So, so yeah, be, because of the- The yeah, be, be, issue? The well, because of the because of the way they're doing the transactions, um, it may not be able to support flash loans or without um, yeah, a so, lot of uh, work, right? Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I so not having work. flash loans is really not an option for advanced DeFi because you you need flash like our our business actually depends on flash loans because we got to be able to flash liquidate. Uh, if you don't flash liquidate for any lending protocol, it's just bad news uh, because you, for any lending protocol in DeFi to succeed, you need to liquidate. And right. in order to liquidate you, without flash loans, you got to commit capital. So your capital is just sitting there, um, not doing anything. <laughs> not to mention, I mean, the opportunity cost is just a small issue. It's not a small issue, but it's one, one of the issues, but also you're, you're running into security problems here and there. So like... Um, not having, but having flash loans, you can quickly just borrow from Aave without collateral, quickly liquidate, trade out of the position and put it back in all yeah, in one transaction. Everything right? in the one transaction itself, yeah. right? It's a complete, so, complete. So not having that is, is a huge problem for, for doing lending on, on Cardano, right? So they're going to have to, um, they're, they're, it's going to be super inefficient. Like whoever is doing lending, borrowing, they're going to have to prepare a ton of capital just in case of liquidations. Um, and, and nobody's going to want to do that, especially if they're alternatives, right? Yeah, so, they're alternatives. Right. So, so that's what I'm saying. Like we need to see how it performs. I, Bitcoin has, has the same UTXO model, right? So yeah, if Cardano but, can't do it, what makes you think Bitcoin can do it better? That's you know what I'm saying? Like, no. like it, it, is, it is possible. I, I just, I need to see it in order to actually know what are some so, of the So, so your thinking is that this whole flash loan concern is based on what the accounting model they are using, what the model they are using. It's a UTX or extended UTX. Yeah, yeah, Ethereum. yeah. So all the blockchains that actually run on account-based model, what Ethereum runs, will probably may not have this issue. But all well, I mean, I, I think ultimately everything can kind of be implemented, but it's just, is it efficient? Okay, is, it, is it performant? Okay. Um, like it's kind of awkward. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's almost like you, 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 you didn't set up your hash table right and you're looking it up uh, with the wrong key or something like that. <laughs> Technically, you could do a table scan and still get it, but it's horrible, right? Um, so, so, you know what I'm saying? Like, like it's, I feel like, with this model, it's potentially doable, but is it is it the most efficient way to do it? Um, now, now I I think, I mean, I've not done any development on Cardano. I, I do plan to once it comes out and matures more. Like right, now, it just came out, right? So I wanted to. I don't think anyone would have done it. You have, and, you have to learn a new language. You have to learn the fruit as. Well, well, I want to. <laughs> maybe, maybe I don't know if, if somebody is is working on DeFi and there's some open source code. I would love to take a look at it and see what it even looks like. I don't know. This this na um, news came in today, so and, uh, I don't have any more details than this. Yeah, I, I, I mean, but based on what I've heard, um, it, it's a pain the butt to do flash loans, right? Or may not even be possible with the current setup. And to me, that just sounds like it's a no-go for a, no -go for a it, good yeah. net lending protocol. That's just no-go. I mean, you can have lending, but it can be pretty risky if you're, if you're not able to liquidate. That's just, that's how you become insolvent, right? So, I mean, so it's possible. I mean, anything is possible, <laughs> right? But it's, uh, we'll have to, we'll have to see. Yeah. But if I got, I'll take a different sort of the technical angle. Um, on because you use the word adoption, right? And you use the word that word adoption, but we have to think adoption of who, right? Because I think there is a difference between putting some some fi on BTC. Is that going to bring more people into into what? People that are not in crypto right now, or are we talking the same people that are in other cryptos that now are going to move into BTC? Why would they do that? If we want to bring people into people that are not into the crypto sphere right now into the crypto sphere, 
they, they don't care about all that technicality. They want an app that's easy where I push a button and I make money. They want something simple. That's not out there yet. So when we say adoption, there is adoption among us, the crypto key people. Yes, you might have people moving around, but I'm much more interested in adoption in the people that are outside of the crypto sphere. And I don't think that that's going to move the needle. Yeah. To, to bring in folks from outside of the crypto world, we need to have this board apes. <laughs> that's easy to understand hey i'm i'm an owner of this thing you try to tell them about flash loans and you know they're suddenly staring at the wall what is this guy talking about flash loans <laughs> and, 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 and building a money legos you talk about board apes talk about uh, you know those eat rocks that's where most of the non crypto people gets oh okay you know i i'll throw in some 100 dollars i can buy some sims uh on solana to get those <laughs> so right. now there are phishing scams coming over yeah that's why nobody attends my uh meetup events because I, i talk about flash and stuff like that nobody wants to listen to that crap <laughs> okay. it's very technical Yo, no, I, I, it's very technical sometimes you have to read those things right like for me for instance you know you know what, what you just said i took some notes but i have to look it up and read it myself for you to really get into my because i'm not in the field of lending like you are So it, it, it's hard to talk about technical things like that without somehow having it in front of you. Yeah. Like I'm more of a trader than a, than a lender. So believe me, when I start talking about trade with people, yeah, you know, I can go on and on and on about telling like my simulations, how I do it and how I don't do it. In, in, that, in 10 seconds, they, they lost. But if I tell them, hey, buy at this price, sell at that price, they get that. It's That's easy. all they want to know. All this thing in between, they don't care. Okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I have the same. So when I started, when you know, we started discussing around the the options, right? The first thing I started was doing an options uh, boot camps and like oh, covered calls and then short put. Okay, just understand that you are basing instead of putting a limit order and waiting for it to hit your price, you basically sell a covered call, wait and get paid. Oh, then, yeah, okay. that's why Ribbon Finance is is the most successful options uh platform on ethereum right if you if you check check them out so uh, so oh, ribbon which one, which one? Uh, it's called ribbon finance so it it so because defi options came out a, a, a while ago uh, like there's open and, and, and i think there's hedgic and all these different uh, options but the thing is it's pretty hard to trade options so so what uh, so ribbon finance has really simplified the user experience so what they're offering is very similar to like structured products so mm -hmm. what they do is you deposit money into a vault mm -hmm. um and then every week the vault automatically executes a strategy so they have different vaults i mean they have a cover call vault mm -hmm. they have a, a a cash secure put vault mm -hmm. they so they have a btc call and then eth call So what they do is every week they just select a uh, um, a strike price based on the delta, which is like delta point mm -hmm. one, I think, is what they select. Okay. And then they just continuously sell that week over week over week, and then that that has generated a huge amount of interest because people don't really want to do options manually because it, it is it's tricky, right? And um, so so with this vault. Now it's like people just park some money into the strategy that just executes automatically over and mm -hmm. over again, and and it's it's really successful. Like the uh, and they yeah. have become pretty much the biggest source of liquidity um, uh, on Ethereum, like in terms of options. Uh, that's they're I like the to, biggest market. I have to check it out. Uh, and in terms of uh, you know how much do you need to deposit in terms of your margin, etc. But doing one contract on a on a Bitcoin, and I don't know what the contract size is. But generally, your contract size will have hundred. I think on the uh, on the general on the for the stocks will generally will have a hundred. Uh, on the futures, I think there was a uh, the Bitcoin on the CME the futures has got a five Bitcoins, which is still a huge notional value. So I was wanting to dip my feet into the micro uh, BTC futures because micro is like one uh, it's one tenth like. One half, so the notional value is a little less, which I can play with. But oh, these I these vaults the are th these vaults have like somewhere around thirty to fifty million. I think the whole uh, no, the, the whole platform. Is, so if I were to let's say if I were to do a, uh, you know, a put right. If I want to sell a put, I want to sell a ten ten delta put just to earn that premium. I have to put forth 
some margin, right? I have to put for some money. Now the question is, if it's mm. going to be cash secure, then I have to basically put the whole notional value of that put. If the strike price of 40,000, right? Then I have to put it, and depending on how many units are in that particular uh, one option contract, I have to put 40,000 multiplied by those units if it is a completely cash secure, right? Or I have mm -hmm. to put an equivalent of assets. Only. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So you have to deposit collateral into the- Yeah, so, yes, so yes. that's a huge collateral, right? <laughs> so that's that's my question. I, yeah. I will definitely look into Rhythm Finance, so okay. that's why I haven't- So the, the way, if, if it does fall, if it does expire, in, in the money, what's going to happen is your 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 collateral is going to get liquidated. That's what happens. Yeah. <laughs> if it expires in the money, they'll have to buy it, and then because I yeah, it, it pretty much settles. yeah, it then it settles, and then you you you're taking a loss. Yeah, basically. Uh, so that's basically um, your, they'll do a cash settle, right? Yeah, yeah, they do that settlement. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, or anybody, anybody can settle. Like that's the thing about DeFi. Anybody can call the smart contract uh, function to settle, but they they have a bot or. or like people run bots to for these. Yes. No, interesting because I, I am I've been on options for for many years and and like I said this whole stuff started because we were I had a separate meetup where we talk about a lot about options and all that and then that's where we started discussing crypto. I'm like okay let's separate it out. Let's separate the options and the stocks. Uh, well, right, you can talk economy. about crypto options. That, that so, then you get. <laughs> yeah, so you get so, so now I'm interested that if you got a crypto options, I anyway you know. When I look at options, I do with everything: strangle, straddle, arid, condor, back, you know, your back ratio, uh, ratio spreads. And oh everything. man, you're gonna spend so much gas. Uh, anything and everything. Options is open <laughs> for me. <laughs> for me, anything and everything under options is open. Yeah, I don't think yeah, executing those complex strategies are probably not feasible right now without paying like. A, a, just an insane amount of gas, and there may not even be enough liquidity right now. Um, yeah, so I'm I mean, you can, <laughs> yeah, excellent, but, uh, but interesting. I'll check them out, but you can check it out. I mean, it's a growing, definitely something that's growing because because we will need um, these these uh, hedging options, and also these um, uh, we're gonna need. I mean, we need derivatives and and, and these hedging options because um, because uh, uh, people need to be able to hedge, right? Um, especially like these large market makers, if they're actually going to do stuff on on the uh, like doing doing stuff, and we will not get a big liquidity. We will not get these uh, market makers if they can't hedge and become delta. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. They're so, not going to take the directional risk. Yeah. So the, there is going to be this. Uh, this is definitely something that's going to get there. It's just right now it's it's kind of just getting developed. Um, so, uh, I'm, but if you can get in early, I mean, it is, it is. Yeah, and today, so today for me to hedge my crypto portfolio, all I'm now relegated is to sell a short calls on Riot blockchain <laughs> or sell a, sell a short calls on, on Coinbase. <laughs> because, you know, okay, that, that is, Correlates to the how the or short uh, micro strategy, right? Oh can you, short, can you easily short? <laughs> can you can you even borrow easily? Like I know GBTC is pretty hard to borrow, right? Which um, GBTC grayscale. Uh, I think at, at least in 2017, people were paying like like a huge hmm. amount of um, interest to borrow. So not like, actually GBTC has been trading at discount. No, like yeah, but but people were trying to short it because back in the day uh, it was like a premium was like what 30 40 percent. So yes. people were like, ah, oh, this is definitely going down. I'm, I'm gonna short it. Well, the thing is, <laughs> when you, the, the borrowing cost of the yeah, shorting that right. was enormous, that's right? Right, yeah, the, yeah. the borrowing cost will be used. So, yeah, so I basically I'm kind of a you know, really, I'm, I'll sell calls against Coinbase or right blockchain these crypto related companies uh, just to hedge a little bit of a crypto portfolio. And now, but if I can find this rhythm finance and actually go ahead and, and use a hedging on directly on a cryptos, that's way more correlated to my crypto portfolio than let's say the, the exchanges or Coinbase or publicly listed mm -hmm. would be. So yeah, just, if you want to do direct directional hedging, you might want to do the underlying. You might not want to use ribbon. You, you, uh, you probably want to use this. Uh, Oppen, uh, or something called Hedgic. Okay, Oppen, um, I think I heard about Oppen in one of the podcasts, and then I forgot about the name of this. Uh, um, okay, I, I will, 
I will definitely check this out. Yeah, because um, yeah, so the, it, it it's liquidity isn't super good, but stack is decent, decent. I mean, for for something in DeFi, this is it's decent, right? Um, and then and then yeah, and then uh, 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 Hedgic is uh, another one that's uh, uh, there's also uh, I think Opium or something. Um, is another uh, on-chain options uh, 464% IV. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I and mean, I've it's crypto. These, it I've, is crypto, I've, right? I've, so. seen these numbers, <laughs> I've seen these numbers during the, the mid-January, not... you know, with GameStop and AMC, oh, guess... 400% IVs. Oh, so, so did you, were you, were you selling options when, when the IV was that high? Yeah, I, I sold, I, I wouldn't uh, sell the, the naked one, but I sold some spreads just to take advantage of the IV uh, crush, right? So. I see. Yeah. Cool, cool. Cool. Now, uh, good to, so Manny, what you were trying to say on? Uh, no, Prabhat was looking for the link oh, for okay. this uh, meetup. Yeah, so this is one, so the, so generally, my the one where we talk a lot more about the stocks, etc. Uh, that is a different one, which is says options for retail investors. So that's we meet every Saturday, except this Saturday because I'm actually traveling, so I won't have any sessions on this Saturday. But uh, that's how we we you know most of the folks in here, we all got got together and. Uh, from there, now we moved on to crypto side of the world as well. So if interested, uh, this is where we go, option for retail investors. Hmm. That's cool. To, what, 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 what is this one then? Oh, so, so, oh, I think the crypto the idea, for the investors and, and there's the cryptos for all, the both converge into the same meeting. Okay. Yeah. But this options for retail investors is where I specifically focus on the stock market, the, the centralized world in, you know, like review what's happening on PayPal and, you know, do an in-depth on any new IPO. As oh, review. that world, that world. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. what, what to do? Yeah, most I feel, okay, I feel so I far away. Okay, I feel I, so far away. <laughs> we, we have to move people slowly from that world to this world, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, so, so that's uh, that's where we talk about the the old world, the bad world, the the trad fight, and uh, that's where we talk about a lot of options, etc. Yeah, so I'm I'm kind of straddling my, you know, both in in the trad fight as well as crypto. But those who are joining from uh, Saturday session, they know I've been like I am no longer bullish on the on the market. It's overall all new investment from my side is going on the crypto side, not adding any money in in the traditional uh, finance side. Um, yeah. But you think the market is going to drop or it has, a, it has a place to be. I mean, the traditional market still has some, some great opportunities. You know, the risk, you know, is of course more manageable, you know, <laughs> I'm talking trade, I'm not talking anything else. We, yeah. So we, I mean, still we'll have, and I don't, See that you know we'll have a world where is only everything is decentralized, everything is crypto. That's no. like, but that won't happen in another for next 50, 60, 100 years, right? So both will coexist. So our idea is how to play both these markets, and as an investor, and I don't, I don't have a very, Correct. I mean, I, I'm okay in playing on both the markets. Yeah, I mean, in traditional finance, I just, I mean, I got my my 401k and retirement accounts just See? in like index funds. I'm not really really that active because I don't... GBTC in your, uh, uh, in your <laughs> IRA, if you have IRA, you can still play it. I mean, I, I hold some GBTC and uh, ETHE in my IRA. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I think right now it's it's probably better. Like back back in the day, it was way, the premium was just way too high. Oh, yeah. Not, like, not right? better. like um, it just didn't make sense. But but yeah, now it's now it's fine. Yeah. So uh, and now, especially because the, the GB, the grayscale, They've already filed an application to, to convert the cost into yeah. an ETF. And right now, if it mm. is a 16% discount, when it gets converted to ETF, that gap will disappear. So you get your 16% kind of a bump. Uh, you're getting get of a 16% cheaper if they actually the, it gets an approval for ETF. 
So, Do you think MicroStrategy is going to become a Bitcoin ETF? So it, for all practical <laughs> purpose, it already is. It's a BI company. It's a BI company. <laughs> I mean, in the future, maybe they'll be like, screw this BI thing. We'll just become an ETF. <laughs> I um, mean, let's, let SEC approve uh, uh, ETF. Then it's possible. Right now, I think they're just circumventing everything. And uh, they have actually given a good way for the other corporates to get exposure to Bitcoin. Right? They're using basically... Yeah, but it's hard to calculate. Is it easy to calculate what, what kind of premium you're, you're paying? Um, with MicroStrategy, because that, that's even more complicated than the GPC, DT, GPC premium, right? Because yeah, so really, you have another I, dimension now. I think, uh, I forgot, when, when they actually did uh, those uh, um, a notes, convertible notes offering, at that mm -hmm. time I did went ahead and looked at it. It's kind of a, um, a call option. So it means those corporates are kind of a holding that call option on Bitcoin. Right. Um, uh, that was that convertible node offering was for, and that's the reason why many of these offerings are getting oversubscribed. I remember in one case he wanted to raise four hundred million dollar, and then uh, the interest was up to six hundred million. I'm like, yeah, I'll I'll get all six hundred million dollar, and he basically uh, went ahead and bought Bitcoin because uh, the the other traditional institutional uh, you know, entities like pension funds, they just can't get an exposure to Bitcoin and there is no ETF. So if they have to take direct exposure to Bitcoin, they'll have to convince their board. They have to convince their, uh, if it's a, a venture, they have to convince their LPs and uh, GPs. They have to change their charter, but they can get a convertible notes. It's already approved. So Hold on, yeah. So of course, for them, yeah, for them it's out to take that exposure, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But once ETF comes in, it'll become much easier for the traditional uh, institution investors because ETF we are already pretty approved to trade in ETF to hold ETFs on our balance sheet. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so Did it. you guys see uh, Michael Sayer uh, letter to uh, to the FICB about accounting principles? No, when did that? Truck? Oh, uh, the check on his uh, Twitter account. He actually posted the letter. It's actually very interesting to read because you see actually like a traditional company that's holding so much. I mean, the majority of the assets is, is of course crypto, right? And they, and I mean, you try to apply like traditional accounting principles to it, but then they they struggle. Uh -huh. And they're asking actually for these accounting principles, you know, to be changed a little bit to really reflect the nature of of how crypto behaves differently than a traditional currency, right? So right. It's, it's interesting. So it's right. trying to do something even from a, and that's a different angle, right? So that's a traditional company that buys Bitcoin and they're saying, uh, we're struggling on the accounting side of it because what you're asking us to do, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So it's a different angle from, it's going to help the crypto world because if they figure out like how the accounting is supposed to work, you might see more companies being willing to add, you know, cryptocurrency to the treasury. True, because right now the cryptocurrency is like a property. I think the accounting says that you have to take the lowest <laughs> Of within that uh, quarterly period, if I'm correct. Yeah, and that, yeah, and that's what they said because then he says that, which I didn't know. Like when you have, you, you cannot, you cannot do adjustments to it. And it's like, well, okay, what? What can you do? True ups. Everybody does true ups in accounting. So how come you can't do true ups? It's yeah. very complex, right? From an account, I, I actually don't understand why it's limited. But the yeah, app is very fair. I thought that was always the case, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, I, I long time ago I worked on on a big tech company on helping them to difference between current, uh, um, current uh, um, rates and historical rates, right? They had it wrong. It's a big company. And it was through, through, a, through a, a merger with another very big company. You know both of them. And the problem is like the accounting principles on how they were looking at exchange rates were wrong. One was doing it at current rate for billing, you know, long time contract. Mm -hmm. And the other one was doing a historical rate. And it was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> And that was like traditional accounting. So imagine in the crypto world, you know, how do you deal, what, what rate are you using, you know, to assess the, the value of your company? Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a question on a discount now. Let's see what's, uh, where it is right now. It's is right. it, is it still? It is. It still was pretty negative. Oh, wow. It yeah, it was very it, negative. Um, it's traced to discount somewhere in, it'll say in March or somewhere, right? end of February. I know I bought somewhere where it was like 16% discount uh, over here. I picked up something in my IRA. Now it is close to 12% discount. But then we'll have to wait two, two 
get a benefit of this, we have to wait until they convert it to ETF. But I'm ready to hold. I mean, uh, sit tight. Yeah. Hold. No, great discussions. It's, oh, it's, we yeah. ran over, we are way over our time and I appreciate everyone coming in and sharing your thoughts. I think this is the way we're going to learn in this one. There are so many changes happening. Uh, it's difficult for any one person to catch up and especially folks like us who got other day jobs. I know, James, you are in this economy, so you are anyway caught up. Our day <laughs> jobs is complete. My day job is completely different. It has nothing to do with this. Oh. So, yeah. so, uh, so it's, it's great to, you know, to talk to you guys and understand what's happening. And I'll do my best to bring in what I'm noticing in here and let's continue this learning. I hope you enjoyed uh, today's discussion. I definitely enjoyed a lot. And yeah, I it's thank awesome. you all for, for all these uh, good discussions. So good meeting you guys. I'll see you in the next one. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs> bye bye. Cool. All right. See you guys. Bye. Bye. See ya.